Good morning, everyone. I'm Nathan Alberg of the Liberty Prairie Foundation. And I'm really glad you're joining us for the Growing Hemp for Grain learning session. Today, you're going to learn about growing hemp for grain from three people, each, of, each with their own in, unique insights. Uh, Steve Tomlins will share his hemp grain growing experience from 2018. Brian Parr will give you a good foundation of hemp agronomy. And Philip Alberti will offer additional information from being on the front lines of hemp growing and entrepreneurial activity in Illinois. I very much hope that this will be helpful in some way to each of you. When we were prepping for this session last week, one of us said something wise, and it wasn't me, that captures the spirit of this. Quote, we're all figuring this out together. I think that's really true for hemp and especially true for our agricultural systems and our rural economies and rural communities. We need to figure things out together. Before we dive in, I wanna share a little bit of backstory. Uh, first, our organization is the Liberty Prairie Foundation. Um, we're a nonprofit organization in the, in the Prairie Crossing Conservation Community in Northeast Illinois. We own and manage a 94 acre organic farm and we use that in our programs to demonstrate uh, support and promote sustainable farming. Second, this event is a result of our participation in the Idea Farm Network. The Idea Farm Network is a network of farmers, researchers, NGOs, landowners, and interested eaters who share information, ask questions, and build support to move us towards better, smarter farming. Uh, Kim Ernst Pitcher with Prairie Rivers Network is here. I'm really grateful for that. Uh, and she coordinates the Idea Farm Network for the group. We and our friends in the network have been working to build a local farmer hub here in Northeast Illinois. We are especially grateful to funders of the network. We offer our thanks to the Lumpkin Family Foundation in Mattoon, Illinois, as well as to Food Land Opportunity, localizing the Chicago Food Shed, a multi-year initiative of the Chicago Community Trust, and the Kinship Foundation. Here are some logistical details as we get into the call. Uh, first, we are recording the session. We'll send you a link to the recording after this, uh, once it's been edited. So don't worry about catching things and that kind of thing. We have muted everyone and restricted video functions so that hopefully this will flow technologically pretty well. We have over 80 participants uh, who signed up, uh, including someone from Australia. Welcome to the land down under. Um, Please use the chat function down at the bottom for sharing questions that you have. Um, uh, please understand that we may not be able to get to everyone's questions during this session, but what we will do is share later on an email with the emails for all of our presenters so you can ask them questions. Uh, everyone's emails will be shared on Wednesday. Let me know if you don't want your email shared. Uh, and a resource list will also be shared. Uh, our speakers shared some resources that they thought uh, were especially helpful. Um, and I wanna ask your, your patience with any technical issues we have. I am not a, a Zoom expert, but we're gonna do the very best we can. So we're about to begin. I'm gonna begin by introducing our first speaker, Steve Tomlins. Uh, after 20 years of an engineering career and some time as a GIS expert, uh, Steve has devoted the last 10 years of his life to farming. Uh, Steve currently co-manages a certified organic farm called Turtle Creek Gardens in Delavan, Wisconsin. There he grows CSA vegetables on 10 acres and rotationally grazes cattle on 80 acres of pasture. He's also had two years of experience uh, farming row crops and he's entering his third season of growing hemp. I've really enjoyed getting to know Steve I believe you're gonna find the documentation he did of his 2018 season really fascinating. And you're also, it's also gonna be a, a sort of a, an insight into the mind of a thoughtful, innovative farmer who loves being on the land. Steve, why don't you take it away? I don't follow up with that, Phil. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <clears throat> I'm gonna just share the screen. Hello, everybody. Thanks for coming. And uh, just get this dog and pony show going. How's that? Can anybody see that? Looks good. All right. So I'm going to do this. I'm going to start the show. Um, all righty. 
Nathan said who we are, Turtle Creek Gardens. Been here six years. Did row crops for a little bit more than two, but I've got, uh, uh, well, I'll just start the show here. Thank you. Uh, this is from our 2018 season. This is actually a picture of the field. I'm gonna just show you a quick video of how easy this was, all right? <laughs> Give more time for people to show up. All right. Alrighty, that was uh, almost the full season besides the planting after the harvest of the way our grain crop went in 2018. Uh, most everything about my concern about getting this crop on the ground was really focused around seed bed preparation. So it started on uh, four acres of sod ground and then we had an acre that had grown winter squash on the year before and before that was corn. So it was gonna be a good test of, of weed loads and things. So it's just an old mold board plow. And then let's see if this is not working. She's choking. Yeah, just a mold board plow. And in this photograph, you can see on the left hand side, uh, that was the ground that had been paired, prepared two years in a row. And uh, with our winter squash, there's a significant weed load in there. Um, it also worked up a whole lot easier on the right hand side of that little lane is a freshly mold board field. Just an old uh, disc run through there. Um, I guess I don't have a date. Yeah. May 16th to May 18th. So plowed it two days later, disked it up. And then well, she's working slow this morning. And then two weeks later, what I did, I mold boarded it, disked it waited for a weed flush of about two weeks, and then ran this cultimulcher over it. So um, anybody that's farmed organically or takes care of weeds without uh, chemicals and things, you kind of wait for the white thread flush. So under, you don't really see a whole lot of weeds in there, but underneath that inch of soil, there's are tons of weeds just ready to erupt. So I ran this cultimulcher two weeks after I had dissed it to try to take care of a weed flush. And, uh, Knowing again, I got to have as good a seed bed as I can for this uh, this hemp seed. I'm gonna click this before I'm done talking. All right, uh, I used an old uh, McCormick 10 grain drill. Uh, don't know the exact age of it, but there is no hemp setting on this particular grain drill. Some of the old John Deere equipment does have hemp on the little chart under the lid, but McCormick's or International's didn't, but I used a uh, a millet. I used I used basically a millet size. It's not exactly the same size, but it's close enough to do whatever calibration I needed for pounds per acre. I'm trying to put hemp seed in there, similar to millet, like I said. Um, I chose to grow this crop. Everybody said it's got to be six inch on center and the whole bit. Um, and this grain drill will do six inches on center, but I chose to be able to cultivate it. Being an organic farmer, not having a whole lot of opportunity to take care of weeds, except with my favorite chemical, iron, 
cold, hard steel. I decided I'm going to grow this crop and cultivate it and see what happens. Two reasons, um, weeds, and I was, I was only putting down 10 pounds an acre on this crop. So what you see in there is a, a gorilla tape over top of the every all the holes except to get four. There's the setup. It's an old international. Uh, all but four holes are taped up on there. That particular drill's got six inch spacing for its uh, planting. I didn't click before I was done talking. <laughs> Must be bandwidth, huh? All right. Can everybody see that orange flag down down the ends of those rows? Now, don't don't worry about it. I can't read it. There's a. I had I taped off. I would I would take a tape measure and every ten feet I'd put an orange flag on the ends of the rows so I could drive straight lines. Um, this is that equipment does not. Yeah, we got GPS. Or great because I think they're going to want me to pump. Somebody's talking. All right, so that got planted. That got planted on June 5th after a rain. There was, there was enough moisture in the ground. There's a, there's a source, resource out there called the Canadian Hemp Trade Alliance. And probably any hemp publication you'll find about trying to get stuff in the ground is hemp will have a significant uh, mortality rate if you plant it uh, in too wet a soil or you get heavy rains after you plant because it, it just it emerges quickly but in wet soil there's a high mortality rate planted this after it had rained and uh, so there's significant moisture in the ground and then within the, the, on this day it had rained so in five days this stuff was planted and out of the ground at this height which was uh, remarkable to me and it made me happy i'll tell you and this this is the seeding rate at 10 pounds an acre through that grain drill, and I had about 12 plants per acre, or 12 plants per foot, or 60 in every 60 in every 10 paces, was it? Whatever it was, it's about 12 plants per foot at 10 pounds an acre is what my is what it turned out to be. People thought I was kind of crazy, and they were probably right, but uh, I know how to cultivate, so I figured I'm going to keep this crop from getting weedy if I can at, at all help it. You can see some of the you can see some of the Weeds are coming now at the same time the hemp here is going. A lot of folks say uh, hemp will outcompete the weeds. And I suppose if you do everything right, it certainly will. But I saw, witnessed way too many crops where people were, were not cognizant of the growth stages of hemp and how difficult it is to keep up with the weeds. Um, you can you could have sprayed this down with something if you're not organic. But uh, uh, I, I don't, I can't. <clears throat> I didn't click again. I need a clicker for me. So here's what happens. Now it's 10 days later after it's been planted. And that old plow I was using would hit some of this hard ground and it would uh, only turn over about four inches instead of eight inches. So there's this, I don't know what kind of grass you call this, uh, but I knew I was in trouble if I didn't get that cultivator working pretty soon. So at 10 days old, I've got places where I've got weeds that are definitely out competing my, my hemp crop. And uh, I start puckering a little bit when that happens. <laughs> so I've got a, uh, in the picture here, you've got a, these are Danish tines. It, the, this used to be a two row cultivator. You can see my welds right here. I got a weld here and then a weld over here. I had to put this back together to make it a four row cultivator. But the year before that, it was a two row cultivator. And before it became a two row cultivator, it was a six row cultivator. All that being said, it's just saying that you didn't have to have a whole lot of expensive equipment and your basic farming skills for the stuff that's in the fence row or just even some of the newer equipment, you, you can take care of this crop. There's the grain drill and the, and the cultivator. Um, this, the, the difficult part about this, this is 10 days old and I cultivated this. It took me eight hours to do five acres. And uh, it was it was excruciatingly painful, but it had to get done. There's a guide wheel on the front of this cultivator that this guide wheel here usually sets in the ground, keeps things straight. I couldn't even put the, these wheels on the ground. The only thing that could touch the ground was these the tines themselves, and they only had to be about two inches into the ground. And uh, 
I had to keep my head down and scratch this up. So this is at 10 days on the second weed flush that comes out after I had cultipacked it, planted everything. So almost two and a half, three weeks later, you're gonna have another weed flush and you gotta cultivate. Um, I'm in a vegetable operation and I've got metal in the ground all the time taking care of weeds. So this was just something that you're supposed to do in this particular system at 30 inches on center. Um, this happened uh, four days after I cultivated it. We got four inches of rain in about two hours. And uh, it was a river. You can see it's kind of hard to distinguish in there, but there are ponds and there are moving ponds across this field. And I thought I was done. I really did. But this is uh, June 22nd, 17 days after it was planted. And four days after that rain. And you see this here, this debris trail, that is the, uh, the silt of the water moving across the field. But these girls had emerged, these boys and girls had emerged and had enough of a root base to hold this thing in place. There was about a quarter inch to half an inch of the, of the plant exposed in some of these little areas due to the way that things were moving across the field. But the plant held on and was ready to grow. So the timing of getting your seeds in into the soil moisture the things will be up in five days. And then uh, within three weeks, four inches of rain and water falling across them, they stayed in place. So that was, uh, that was encouraging to see an experience with that, that particular plant. This is uh, the 22nd, again, seven days that after I revisited that thing after the rain, they're all about three, four inches tall now. That's a, that's a Gerber, not a Leatherman. But uh, they're, they're healthy, they're happy to be in the ground, lots of moisture, roots are setting themselves in place and uh, doing well. Um, this is the July 1st, so I'm not quite a month old, but this stuff, had, now it's almost a foot tall across the whole field. So what's that making? You know, in, in 30 days, it's about a foot tall. You can see in the front here, there's some Johnson grass and there are some weeds in row coming. But I was able to get in front of them. The plants had a chance once they got cultivated and the rain didn't make it all that terrible. This is uh, the same time period. It's time to cultivate again. You can see in here, you know, the grasses are coming. This is the, this is the field that had the uh, winter squash in it. So there is, there's much greater weed load in this field because it had been disturbed. And then when we grow on our plastic culture, it just, uh, you just can't get to the weeds and it makes a mess. So this is a pretty heavily weeded field, but it's time to cultivate again. And this is July 7th. This is six days later. So in just five days after cultivating it, these plants jumped on another foot tall. It's something about getting the oxygen in the air and oxygen into the soil once you break open the crust and knock down any weed pressure around it. The plants just jump. So um, this is this is all of knee high and six days after it looked like this. So the conditions were perfect. Moisture was right. Heat was right. Cultivation was on the right time. And uh, the, the plant just took off. So I'm getting giddy about this time. <clears throat> since, uh, since part of what we have to do is research to grow hemp up to the 2018 Farm Bill, maybe even included in the Farm Bill here in the United States, I, uh, the only difference between this part of the field and this part of the field is that I drove over this about 20 times and this only got hit twice. And the reason I did that was I didn't want to continue to mash down the road that I had on over here. <clears throat> but when I planted this, the seed bed from on this side didn't really look any different than this. But that four inches of rain took this pulverized soil that got run over with a disc and the cultipacker 15, 20 times. It was a beautiful seed bed, but when the rain hit it, it made it anaerobic basically and compacted the heck out of it. And it made it really difficult. So this is a compaction issue in this field compared to just a, as minimally tilled and worked soil as possible over here. 
Um, this was sod ground. It hadn't been turned over in probably 15, 20 years. Um, but this was overworked soil um, and compaction makes a difference. So I put that one on there and it's easy to research. Now I can just, when I write down uh, in my research program, it's a one sentence thing, compaction is bad for hemp. Well, you know, it's bad for anything, but here's a perfect example. And that compaction came from too, too fines and too much rain. This is, uh, I can get this out of the way. There, just cover up my notes. All right, within 35 days, male plants are starting to show up already. And this stuff is, this, this, the male started shooting up tall and everything else, but they're about chest high right now. Oh, waist high. There's a, the next picture shows waist high. So we're 45 days into the grow. And this is what the field looked like. No weeds, nothing, nothing noticeable, nothing, no lamb's quarter or pigweed or velvet leaf trying to get above this stuff. And uh, I'm pretty tickled at this point. You can tell lots of shading in the aisles. This is pretty much oriented east-west. The sun's overhead a lot, maybe a little bit to the north of this, but uh, good coverage. Hmm. Just a picture of the cultivation. This is 50 days, uh, 50 days mature and cultivated, whatever the date was. But there's you know little stuff in there. But the shading over at this spacing worked just fine. This plant does like to bush out. Most any plant will actually cover in wherever the space it has to try to grow. Just another picture 10 days later. Um, really satisfied with the weed control. Again, you can see little stuff that's in row, but it just couldn't compete. It was disturbed enough during the cultivation that it couldn't compete. Uh, August 4th, it's two months now since this has been planted. And it's uh, 60 days old or so. And at 60 days, this particular crop called Yuma crossbow was the name of this seed that we grew. And uh, it's in full flower, full pollination mode. She's, she's making seeds. Um, I've seen that picture before, it's my background, but this is that same field at that time. I just, I would walk into this field and I would walk around that field in between the rows and I'd come out all covered in yellow and uh, look at all the bees and bugs that were in there. And it was, it was a lot of fun to, to walk around something that I was able to co-create and uh, experience something really healthy for me. It, it just, it was good for my spirit to, to be a part of what this hemp plant would do and how it, how it worked. You know, the, the, here's one anecdotal point though. Don't wear the same sweatshirts and clothes and then go work on your CBD crop if you happen to have one because you're gonna pollinate you're going to pollinate your plants. You can ask me how I know later. Um, about the time all that was going on, you probably have heard things about feral hemp or land race hemp. <clears throat> this is an example of hemp grown, growing in a forest about a quarter mile from me. This is an, an understory area where a bunch of cattle graze. And they don't particularly like the hemp, but this is this was feral hemp, and I knew I was going to have problems with pollen anyway. I went and found it. It's a friend of mine's farm, and uh, we only live about six miles north of one of the last row plants in the state of Wisconsin. So between here and everywhere, it was getting to the row plant. The roads are covered in, in hemp and uh, wild populations. This particular farm did grow hemp for the uh, the dairy and rope factory, so it's it's everywhere. So I knew I was going to have pollen. But the experiment was let's see what it does, and we put it in the greenhouse and these taller plants here, these right here are the, this one too, are the, uh, the seeds that came from that feral, that feral stock just a quarter mile away. But in the greenhouse, they grew to be six feet tall in no time, where is in this, in this understory, I've been there many times and they're never more than a couple feet tall just because of conditions. But in the greenhouse with some good soil and some loving, they took right off. In no time, they were up against the ceiling, and we knew we had to do something, but we really weren't in a hurry to do so because we plant a quarter million vegetable starts every year. 
So there's usually other priorities than tinkering with hemp. What ended up happening was this hemp in the greenhouse in these pots got sick as heck. It didn't want to, it got to the top, it was too hot, and the aphids moved in. If you've ever seen aphid damage on any kind of crop, you can see all the, uh, what is it the aphids make that the ants like? It's uh, sugar, it's uh, somebody knows. Anyhow, this is all the stain from the bugs and the habitat that was created on a sick plant, covered in aphids, all these little white dots in, on this particular stem, those are all aphids. So uh, the aphids moved in and had a sick plant. This is not from that particular grow, but last year out in a CBD crop I had, you can get a pretty good forest of, of aphids on your plants and they can really make some, they can make some damage. Um, people always ask me, well, what are you gonna do about the aphids? And I always tell them, I'm just gonna wait. I'm just gonna wait and see when the ladybugs show up because the ladybugs will show up. So it was a matter of, it was just a matter of days when this thing got put outside and like in any predator prey cycle, these ladybugs moved in and cleaned this plant up in no time. And it was kind of remarkable to see this thing's about six foot tall now and, and uh, sicker and all get out. The stalk's not much bigger than your index finger. And um, just figured that we're gonna be throwing this away. Well, the, the ladybugs came in, cleaned everything up and in about, oh, let's see, I don't have the dates on this, but this is a seed head from that exact same plant. And the reason you see all that pretty blue sky behind it is because I'm looking up at it. So over eight foot tall is the seed head that developed on that sick plant. So it's a pretty, it's a, it's, it's a pretty hardy plant in that it went through quite a lot of stress. And once it got cleaned up, it was still able to produce uh, and do well. So one of the things that, bring up about the feral is the conditions in the understory, poor growth, give it some good soil, and the thing got eight foot tall. This was a fiber crop, a, a fiber variety probably in its day. It's been growing in the woods for 70 years now, so who knows what it's truly adapted. And with that point, with all the feral hemp in the ground, if you're gonna try and grow any kind of seed stock, then the, and try not to have any cross pollination, you may have trouble trying to grow consistent varieties if you're in an area where, where there was feral pollen. Or there is feral plants, but because uh, they will, they will, they, they'll cross pollinate your stuff, and you'll have trouble with your uh, phenotype expressions and consistency. Um, this is a just a picture of an indeterminate seed head. There are varieties that have things. The seed is not much bigger than the, the back of my hand to my fingers there, but this particular variety um, grows an 18 to 20 inch seed head. And if you're not familiar with indeterminate, they begin to mature. Mature from down here, um, and by the time you need to harvest this thing, about this much, this will be a little over mature. This will be just about right, and this will be way too green. But that's that's what it's like to have to harvest the hemp grain. It doesn't all ripen at the same time. Um, Brian will probably talk about the varieties that uh, are shatter resistant and uh, more consistent for combine head height and things. Um, and we'll talk maybe about how difficult it is to take care of the seed too. I'm at 23 minutes. Looks like I'm doing okay. Um, so just a picture of how big the seed heads are. I'm, this is back to the grain crop in the field. The other thing was just a uh, just a side note. While while that was going on, I was messing with barrel hemp too. Uh, now this next slide comes up. It's August. Let's see what would it be. Started getting started getting pollen at 35 days. She doesn't want to advance. Am I all blurry now? No. Okay. Now, August 16th. One of the things we noticed, the Japanese beetles really happen to like the hemp pollen, the male, the male pollen. There's a little bit of damage to some eating of the leaves of the other plants, but predominantly it's a negligible effect on the eating of the, the leaf matter and the, the vegetative growth and something about the palms suiting their fancy because they congregate and make a lot more Japanese beetles, it looks like. So just a heads up and you'll see them. I wouldn't get too worried about it. They didn't seem to do a whole lot of damage of anything. They may be vectors, 
of diseases, which is a possibility, but um, they don't really eat a lot, it seems. Um, this is a picture. We're at uh, August 14th, so we're 75 days into the cultivation, and the males are starting to die back. Notice all the yellowing on the plant there. As the, as the males die back, there's more sunlight getting into the rows and broad leaves where the first ones to show up. There's some dandelions in here. Dandelion coming in. Um, probably a giant ragweed right there. Some dandies. So the cultivation, this plant, the males are done. We're 75 days into this thing and we still have very few weeds. This happens to be a picture, you kind of see this patch of grass right here, it got really thick. There was a, uh, an area where I had a dead furrow and a, a problem with the plow and it uh, got pretty heavy in that area. Uh, but the things are yelling up, males are dying, a lot more light getting in. This is again, August 24th, 80 days into things now. Um, you can see here, this beautiful monarch. I, I was re It was remarkable to me to see how many insects many beneficial insects come to this particular uh, plant. And the, that season was a pretty good season for monarchs. And they were in this field continually, just hanging out on the, on the hemp. Um, maybe just a convenient place to stop, or they were drawn to something they needed, which is what I tend to lean towards. You see here, there's a dead male plant here. This is a, so that all the pollination's taking place. These are pretty much dead. And uh, you can see this is an end row. Um, this is a picture of September 2nd, probably a, hopefully a week before it's time to harvest. And uh, things are heavy. They're starting, this is that row that you saw in that original picture. These are starting to get heavy. They're listing, they're listing a little bit. I never really had any lodging. We had some pretty heavy rains come through and they would just kind of lean over a little bit. And I had almost, I can't think of any lodging that actually occurred, just plants laying over. Now running the combine through something like this, you're thinking, this could be troublesome, and in some respects, um, I have proved I have proven that it was difficult to work through plants that are kind of all over the place and very different heights. Uh, mouse, 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 mouse! Come on. Um, about this time, we had things tested. This particular seed, um, zero THC, and about two percent CBD at the time. Um, you still have to comply with uh, total THC in the United States, and you still have to get this thing tested. This particular variety, this is uh, I was just taking. This was taken August twenty third, about uh, a week or so, you know, a couple weeks, no, a week, a week before this picture. And when this picture was taken, a week before that picture, got it tested. You have to get testing done. This thing did amazing. It almost has, almost always has zero THC, even at full maturity. And it's been, it's been harvested in uh, Colorado up to uh, three to four percent CBD. Um, again, this is pri just prior to harvest for 90 days in uh, I think this is about the same place. The weeds are starting to say thank you. Got some smart weed coming in, and there's more things showing up. Uh, the purse lanes and the you know, there's some, there's some milkweed coming in. So uh, three months after cultivation, I don't have things overtaking the plants. But if I don't do the right thing here, I'm going to have a mess the following season. Uh, this is right prior to harvest. You'll notice there's really no yellow. There's no males in here. All this dark brown is uh, are the dead males. The females are just setting their seed. And probably one of the most critical parts about this uh, wrapping, when people talk about combines being a problem, I will say don't scrimp on inexpensive combines to get through this crop. The, the wrapping of the Teflon strength fiber is a lot of these dead males. The females still have, uh, there's enough, there's probably 70% moisture in that plant. They're not nearly as troublesome as all that dry. So half that crop is dry, ready to destroy your combine and equipment fiber. Um, I'm kind of a old machinery romantic and I tried to harvest this crop 
with an old uh, Alice Chalmers all crop. And it's a great seed cleaner, but it is not designed to go through the fiber of a hemp crop. And well, it was a lot of fun. I made it on TV. They showed me running this thing, which was fun. But uh, it was it's really hard on this equipment. Uh, can only take two rows at a time, which was fine. But listening to go through that concave was uh, was painful. A couple things that happened. You hear about a lot of fires with hemp production and bearings getting wrapped. Well, on this particular picture, you'll notice all this grease right here. This is a bearing that you wouldn't want to touch it right now. It's not smoking in this photo, but anytime I was going downwind with the combine after making the turn, when you start smelling, you start smelling uh, heat, it's time to stop and clean your combine. Um, anybody that's run a combine knows the vibration, the hum when you're cruising through a field, there's just a, there's just a hum to things. When that hum changes, you better be paying attention or and shutting her down. And I recommend that if you ever run your combines in hemp, especially the when the vibration change, shut her down, go figure out what the hell happened because there's something where it doesn't belong and it's probably hemp fiber. It's a 1953 all crop. The next uh, thing I did with my romantic journey into hemp was I got this turn of the century uh, AT Feral Clipper 2B and took that first batch of grain and just decided to work it and figure out what kind of a job I had in front of me getting this crop harvested. Uh, I don't think they had the fan, but I did it the way they did. With that. They didn't have an electric motor either, but uh, this is a picture of the chaff. Now, what, when you harvest, because you're harvesting an indeterminate seed head, there is a lot of green material in there. Um, if it's a weedy field, you get all that in there. If it's not, you just have about 30 to 40 percent material you don't need in your seed, and it came from the darn the seed head anyway. So, this is the chaff material within within 12 to 15 hours after I harvested that first little bit. The chaff got up to almost 120 degrees, and in the seed portion that was cleaned, it's already up to 87 degrees. And you're starting to get to that place where the temperatures are too warm for your oil qualities. So um, I've heard it said that you get about four to six, maybe 5% moisture out of the seed once you get it out of the field. You have about the time to get from the field to your farm to have this crop get saved. That's how fast it gets hot. In six hours, that bin would be 100 degrees um, if you just let it sit maybe 85 degrees, but she's cranking up there. And if it was left alone, you'd be at 120, 130 overnight. If you just harvest it, come home, say, I'm tired and you want to do it again, do this tomorrow. You might as well have just thrown the whole thing to the hogs. They're not, and you, you, you got to get this crop handled quickly. So this, uh, this 87 degrees was the next morning after it had been cleaned. And I, I started scrambling right away to get this spread across the floor and, and put back to that seed cleaner because um, that's too hot and I don't want my seed that hot. While all the shenanigans were going on around my Alice Chalmers all crop that I had such a fondness for and realized I had destroyed it or was about to, about a week went between um, when it should have been harvested and about now. And I don't know if you what you see on your screen, but if it looks like it just got really dirty, um, those are goldfinch, and I'm going to play a little video. We'll see if it runs for you here. But this video, come on. Wrong button. It wouldn't work for me. What happened was the darn, uh, oh no, that was the wrong button. Screen still shared? Yep, there you go. Yeah. Um, what ended up happening between my all crop.
and getting my next combine was it coincided with the arrival of the goldfinch migration. So if, if you notice in the sky there, there are thousands of these goldfinch flying around this hemp field. I don't know how well you can see it, but all that stuff flying across the sky, there were thousands of them. And as I combined this field, they would fly up into the trees. When I get to the end to turn around, they'd fly back down and get in front of me. And I got videos of these things bouncing off the windshield of the, of the combine because they were trying to get to that grain before I took it from them. Uh, coincident with that, uh, they were knocking off the seed and the ground was full of morning doves. So uh, when the birds show up in your hemp crop field, it's probably too late to get your maximum yield, guaranteed. So the birds and the goldfinch, they kind of aggravated me, but I realized, you know, we share this space. They're going to be fat and happy. It's the first time they've eaten hemp like that before the migration, so they probably did well, and I expect to see a whole lot more of them from now on. I went and borrowed another friend of mine's. Uh, once I got the combine taken care of, I, I borrowed another person's. This is an old International 1420. Um, not really set up for hemp. Uh, it, was, it was tough on the old girl, too. I almost destroyed two combines. And I'll show you what I mean by that. I was only taking two rows at a time and going like one mile an hour to get this in and not destroy the concave and everything else. This is, uh, this is a wad. This wad of this wad of hemp came out of this hole off of that shaft right there. And on five acres, actually this is only four acres, the one acre I did over here came from the Alice Chalmers and this international did four acres. And I did this two and a half times out of that main shoot shaft. And this is all just the dead hemp that, that's messy. That, that, that was one of the, uh, I hope I didn't break this thing, thoughts when the vibration changed and it was subtle. This is one of my favorite pictures. When I got to the end of this harvest, that's the last three rows. And I decided to bow to Lady Hemp. Uh, she does not give up her crop and bounty without a tussle or obedience. So in, I just got out and thanked her because she pretty much taught me a few lessons that uh, I'll never forget and I was grateful for. So the combine's running. I figured I'd show my obeisance. One of the things that happened with all those birds early on, you'll notice, I'll see this, all this understory. This is actually weed, not weeds. I mean, hemp. This is, this is the cover crop that started. Uh, this is September 29th after right about the time of the harvest. And there's that much uh, emergent uh, seed growth, uh, plant growth from lost seed that had been going on for a while. Uh, the, the timing of your harvest is critical. You get there after the birds, you're done, and have the right equipment and don't scrimp on your combine. You can get away with it, and I did, but it was uh, it was painful. I ended up with about 400 pounds per acre and uh, was satisfied. It was enough to handle, so I'm trying to clean and dry 2,000 pounds of hemp seed in that old equipment, and uh, it worked. But here's a cover crop of hemp seed on uh, September 29th. Um, get back to the barn. I'm spreading it out on the ground. I got fans everywhere. This pile's not clean. You can see all the chaff that's in it and it's probably sitting that close to 90 degrees. And I'm, uh, I'm scrambling. I stayed up two or three nights until we, we night, we into the hour, whatever, that, however that saying goes. Stayed up late trying to get this thing done. And um, if you're gonna go small scale and you have this kind of equipment, uh, two, three, 4,000 pounds and lots of places to lay this out to get it to dry, you're gonna need it. And it's probably gonna be rainy and moist and you're not gonna have an awful lot of uh, help from mother nature in this part of the country to keep things dry while you're trying to get this grain down to nine, 10% moisture. How are we doing? Well, I just started and Let's see, 747, getting close. All right, this is final clean out. Again, more wrapping up inside that main chute. I got things like this over any bearing that's exposed all in that combine. And uh, it took hours and hours to clean it. But that's what you're supposed to do anyway. Um, 
couple more pictures here. This is, if you want to have an idea how much grain I lost, in my estimate at least, I lost at least 400 pounds an acre. This is the cover crop that started the following spring. So I had this kind of hemp growing all over that field. So I had an early flush cover crop and then a spring flush cover crop. And the birds ate probably, I don't know how much they ate, but they got their share. Uh, this is the field the following spring. One thing I really like about it, this, this is all about 18 to two foot tall. I had I was planting winter squash on this. Um, this is residue from the previous year that had to be incorporated. And I thought this is gonna be nightmarish, but because of the hemp fibers that have, were such a nasty thing to deal with in the combine, a year, three, four months later after spring or whatever time period was, uh, this stuff is fully redded or rotted, controlled rotted. And I just ran a rotavator over this stuff to prepare the ground for my plastic mulch layer. And that stuff incorporated fantastically. It broke down little shivs, the fibers were nothing. You could pick them up and just pull them apart with your fingers, as opposed you couldn't you couldn't break them holding on to them with pliers uh, when they're when they're freshly uh, dead. But incorporating this into your soil and the organic matter you're going to get in that type of a production system, organic, I, I am fully uh, sold on how good that is for the soil uh, and being able to work it the, the following year. And thank you for your interest in hemp. Um, this is Turtle Creek Gardens. We're a certified organic farm. We're part of the Real Organic Project. And uh, there's some information. Thank you. All right, Steve, thank you so much for a great presentation. Um, I love the slide of you uh, paying your respects to Lady Hemp. That was awesome. <laughs> and I, I really love how, you, how well you photo documented everything. I'm going to have Kim uh, sort of share some of the questions that are coming up in the chat line. Kim, do you want to go ahead? Sure. Yeah, thanks, Steve. That was great. Um, our first question is, can you remind us how deep you planted the seed? Yeah, that uh, <clears throat> you don't want any deeper than uh, three quarter inch, half inch is optimal. Uh, in that seed bed, I just had your typical discs that you can put on your hydraulic rams. And uh, the, the seed depth's quarter, three quarter inch. And with that old equipment, precision drilling is not that easy. Uh, you better drive 10 feet and check it and drive 10 feet and check it and drive 10 feet and check it. And then when it gets about right, take off. But seed depth is hypercritical with this half to three quarter inches optimal. I know I had stuff deeper, but the soil was loose and they, they emerged just fine. Thank you. Um, our next question. Um, <clears throat> In the future, after this experience, would you consider planting a fall winter rye and then crimp that in the spring and plant green through that to help with weeds and soil erosion? You know, I witnessed something that Philip showed or experimented with, and I thought it was wonderful. Uh, I, I don't have the equipment to do it. I like, I like it as a practice, and I think it will do the job. Uh, but what I understand, I need a whole lot more seed uh, to deal with whatever's going to happen in those rows amongst the cover crop that was there, the rye, um, I would consider it. I think you need the right equipment and things have to be perfect. So just like anything, execution and seed bed is just critical and uh, it's doable if you got the right stuff. Okay. Can you share um, if you know what your organic matter and P and K levels were prior to planting? I missed that last part. I heard the organic matter and what? And your P and K levels prior to planting? Um, I don't have them in my memory. I know my organic matter in the hay field was close to three-ish because that stuff hadn't been turned over. Anything that I've worked years in a row on this farm were at about two, two and a half max organic matter. Um, what I did that first year in 2018 is I added zero amendment. <clears throat> um, and I just let it do its thing to see what it was capable of. And the new sod ground had had a bunch of alfalfa on it for years, would have enough of what it needed. And that crop flourished. So to specifically answer the question, I don't know what those values were. Um, my pasture tests are typically, is it low in potassium because it's pasture and high in, I forget the numbers. That's why I write them down. But no, I don't know those answers. But they were acceptable and the crop did wonderful. It was just a, just a sod ground and whatever happens after harvesting hay for 10, 15 years. Excellent, thank you. 
Um, our next question is, how far were your grain fields from your CBD fields? That particular field was four miles downwind of the CBD field. But I carried it all back in on my clothes and made a mess of a few plants. I mean, I, <laughs> and the feral hemp got me too, but it was four, it was four miles downwind. And um, did you have um, a lot of choices for um, where to buy your seed? When you no, in 2018, I made a clandestine rush out to a Colorado and drove back in the dark. And uh, at that time, I didn't. I wanted that seed because it was what I call the karma seed, meaning um, I have full rights to it. I think seeds belong to people, not so much corporations, although I believe in why we make things right so we can do what we got to do. But my particular thinking is uh, I wanted to find seed that I could own and have rights to and give to others. So that is what that seed is. And there were choices out there. Getting them into Wisconsin at the time in 2018 was almost impossible. They're, they're, uh, uh, and in the time and energy I had, this is what I chose because it then became uh, mine. Great. And one last question. Did you apply any extra nutrition prior to planting or side dress your applications? Zero. That was a completely wild let her grow crop. Um, most importantly, I didn't want to, I didn't want to over nutrify anything being pretty much naive to what this girl was going to do. And I didn't want to give, I didn't want to overfeed her and have her get all excited and get hot. Oh my goodness. Yeah. <laughs> Don't over nutrify your plants. It's a waste. But give them what they need. Great. Thank you. You're welcome. All right, so I'm going to, uh, Steve, while you are um, unsharing your screen. Oh, sure. Uh, that'd be great. There was one last question, Steve, about what was your grain yield for that crop? I ended up, I ended up with 400 pounds an acre in my uh, bins, um, and I described it. I'm, I would not under it wouldn't be an underestimate to think I lost four to 500 pounds to the birds and uh, faulty equipment. And just old antique equipment that wasn't quite prepared. Okay, got it. Yeah. All right, Steve, thanks again. That was really, that was excellent. So we're now going to move uh, to Brian Parr. Uh, Brian grew up and still lives on his dad's organic dairy farm near Lafarge, Wisconsin. He graduated with a soil and crop science degree from the University of Wisconsin Platteville and later became a certified crop advisor. He's worked in the agricultural industry, consulting with crop farmers for over 10 years and has been involved with industrial hemp since 2018. Uh, Brian is also a crop farmer himself and grows organic corn, barley, industrial hemp, and cover crops. He uses his own farming to gain a more thorough understanding of the agronomics of these crops, which helps him be a better crop consultant. Brian, we're so helpful, so glad that you can be here. Take it away. Yeah, thanks, Nathan. Okay, so I'm gonna, you, you guys hear me fine? All right, so uh, we're gonna talk about uh, hemp for grain. And uh, what I wanna do here first is just kind of go over some of the general characteristics uh, that uh, this, I'd like to consider this crop a little more similar to growing small grains as opposed to like corn or soybeans. Uh, so if you think of it that way, uh, it helps to get past the hurdle of just corn and soybeans in the rotation. Uh, this type of hemp does consist of both male and female plants. And usually, usually the ratio is a one to one. Uh, so 50% of each, uh, you know, we could see a little bit of variance there, but generally it's a one to one ratio. Uh, as Steve kind of pointed out with his pictures and, and talked about there, uh, once pollination uh, occurs and finishes, those male plants will completely die. Uh, so that'll generally happen towards the end of August or, or end of July, early August sometime, uh, but they will be completely dead at the time of harvest and only the female plants will be the living plants out there. Uh, this is a pretty fast growing crop once it hits its rapid growth stage. Uh, generally, uh, we go through what we call a slow growth phase for the first, uh, say, 30 days or so. Uh, we saw some pictures uh, there with Steve's uh, operation. And then 
roughly 30 days or so after planting, uh, it hits its rapid growth stage and we can usually see between two and three inches of, of growth per day. Uh, most grain varieties that are out on the market are usually in that 100 to 105 day, maybe 110 day maturity. Um, and, and that really talks to more of the days from planting to harvest. And I'll, I'll touch on that here in a minute. Uh, generally speaking, uh, the type of soil that we're really looking for with this crop is more of a, a well-drained type of soil. So either our sandy or loamy type soils. Uh, the reason for this is that hemp really does not like wet weather, uh, especially early in the season. And our heavy clay soils can, can keep the soils a little wetter longer, uh, and they tend to remain cooler longer in the season as well. So. Uh, our our well-drained, lighter soils tend to be a better option for this crop. Uh, on top of that, uh, this is a, a fairly weak seedling, and our heavy clay soils can pose some challenges for it to get out of the soil and emerge properly. Uh, generally, we want to plant uh, at 50 degrees soil temperatures. Uh, this is about the same time they recommend for corn. So. Uh, what we typically recommend is, is that farmers get their corn planted first, and then after corn's planted, uh, uh, start looking at planting the, the hemp. Uh, optimum air temperature, 65 to 75 degrees. Uh, this is not a crop that requires uh, heat units like corn. Uh, so when we, when we talk about the maturity of being 100, 100 or 105 days, uh, it is not a relative maturity like what we see with corn. Uh, this is based on uh, basically day length or photo period. Uh, this is a photo period dependent crop, similar, more similar to soybeans, uh, that it requires at least uh, 10 hours of darkness to initiate flowering. So typically when we get towards the summer solstice, uh, June 21st uh, and beyond, uh, the days start getting shorter, uh, that initiates the flowering stage uh, of this crop. And and we could see that happen maybe uh, kind of right around that time frame. It's not so dependent like a CBD crop would be. Uh, moisture requirements, uh, you know, this is a fairly drought tolerant crop, but it does still have a minimum moisture requirement, which is going to be in that 10 to 15 inches of, of rainfall or moisture per year. Uh, usually most areas in the Midwest are not going to have a problem with this. Uh, however, we deal with some farmers in say Western North Dakota and Eastern Montana, uh, areas where it's a little bit, quite a bit drier, I guess you'd say, and, and it's a little more hard pressed to even hit 10 or 15 inches a year. So just, just keep that in mind. It does have a minimum moisture requirement. Uh, soil fertility, uh, I, would, I would definitely say that we want to avoid uh, marginal soils with low fertility. Uh, this crop is really one that will respond to high fertility soils, good productive soils, uh, and you'll be likely disappointed uh, if you put it on soils that, that really need a lot of work to them. Hey, Brian. Yep. Could you enlarge your uh, viewing screen so we don't see the next slide? Is that possible? Uh, let's see. Oops. No, I'm not really sure here. Let's see. Display settings. Let's see if I can try that. Yeah, I see that. I don't know why. Let's see if I can try another option here. Yeah, if you okay. got two monitors, it's just sharing the other monitor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll try that. Thanks, thanks for yeah. uh, telling me about yes. that. Yes, sorry for the inter interruption there, Ryan. No, that's great. No, I appreciate that. Is that any better? Ucho. Yeah, there you go. Bingo. All right. Excellent. Sorry about that. No, no problem. Uh, so when we look at uh, uh, field selection, I, I'll say this, that uh, field selection in my mind is probably the most critical portion of determining where you want to plant this crop. Uh, so two main guidelines that we talk about with farmers are uh, kind of what I mentioned before, is that we want to choose fields that are the most productive fields uh, and of those fields, the ones that have the least amount of weed pressure. Uh, this is, those two things are going to maximize our success uh, with growing this crop. Uh, anything outside of those boundaries, we start to, 
uh, the success rate becomes a little less uh, each time we, we choose other fields besides our most productive and least weediest fields. Again, we want fields that are well-drained. Uh, try to avoid fields that have compaction. Uh, Steve showed a, a nice photo there where we had some compaction issues. Uh, that, this crop is not one that, that uh, responds well to compaction. Uh, we also want to avoid fields that are prone to disease, uh, particularly uh, white mold. Uh, hemp is susceptible to white mold, uh, so we want to be conscious of that uh, when we're thinking about where to put this crop in the rotation. Uh, so we just got to be careful rotating after soybeans because soybeans is a host for white mold as well. Same with, uh, say, canola, sunflowers, some of the other crops that, that are susceptible. Uh, in that case, we want to look at rotating, say, after a small grain or corn, for instance. Uh, in these scenarios, uh, there likely will be an increased need for nitrogen uh, if you're not removing the residue, uh, mostly for the fact that, that the, the biology in the soil is going to immobilize some of that nutrients, uh, the nitrogen, to break down those corn stalks or, or straw residue. Now, when we talk about organic, uh, you know, where we've seen the most success uh, is where farmers are being very conscious of planting this crop, uh, following the previous crop that can allow for uh, a limited number of weeds the next year. And, and I guess the, the best scenario that we have seen so far in organic production is when we're rotating hemp following alfalfa or clover. Uh, and th there's two reasons for this. One is that we get really good weed control uh, when we're following a sod crop like alfalfa or clover. Uh, but two, we're getting residual nitrogen. And this crop is a nitrogen consumer. And uh, for those two reasons, we are getting our best organic crops following those two uh, or some type of a sod uh, plow down. We could look at uh, rotating after winter rye. Uh, I know there was a comment there about this. Uh, we still have to be conscious of the allelopathy, uh, so, so maintaining that uh, termination date, 10 to 14 days after uh, terminating uh, would be a good idea because this is a fairly small seeded crop and, and we want to avoid any uh, damage uh, done from allelopathic uh, uh, effects. Uh, when we're in an organic rotation, uh, we, we really don't recommend rotating hemp after corn or after soybeans. Uh, and, the, and the reason being is that largely due to the weed pressure uh, that we typically see following those crops. Uh, you guys who are organic uh, understand that, say, doing two years of corn or a corn fo soybeans following corn, you're usually getting a fair amount of weed pressure that second year uh, after uh, an alfalfa plow down or, or some other rotation. So, Keep this in mind uh, for those who are organic that uh, this is following corn or following soybeans is likely going to provide a, a much higher weed pressure scenario than if we were to follow a sod crop. Uh, one other strategy we could look at is, is increasing uh, planting rates uh, to help uh, act more like a smother crop. Let's see. Computer's being slow now. Um, you know, when we, when we look at uh, fertility here, if this will pop up for me, there we go. Uh, <clears throat> the, the greatest demand for nutrients is really increasing with plant age. And, and uh, we see this greatest demand at the time of flowering. Uh, and I'd really say that it begins at the time of rapid growth, uh, being that we're getting two or three inches of growth per day that's starting to consume a lot of nutrients at that point. So, you know, we, we often talk about doing split applications of uh, fertilizer, particularly nitrogen. Uh, I know a lot of farmers are, are putting their nutrients up front uh, prior to planting, but if we could time this a little bit better, we could avoid having some losses due to uh, wet weather or, uh, you know, the inability for the crop to take that up all at once uh, right away at the very beginning of the stages, early growth stages. Uh, quite the wide pH range. Uh, I do think that we'll likely see this start to narrow as more universities uh, like the University of Illinois will likely uh, come up with some better recommendations for pH range. Uh, but so far we haven't seen much issue. Uh, we deal with farmers from North Dakota through Indiana and there are some higher pH soils uh, the more westward you go. 
Uh, we still have yet to see much issue with, with uh, having high alkaline soils or, or even too acidic uh, soils. But in that six to seven and a half range is, is where most farmers are likely going to be anyways. Uh, so in terms of nutrients, nitrogen is key. Uh, this is a nitrogen consumer. Uh, now I put here an example of urea. Obviously, those of you who are organic are not going to be able to, to use that particular nutrient. But uh, just to give you an idea that 125 to 150 pounds per acre of actual nitrogen is what we want to look for. And uh, like I say, this can all be applied up front or doing split applications or even foliar applications if necessary, uh, if, if, if time permits. Uh, phosphorus, uh, somewhere in that 40 to 70 pounds per acre. Uh, and then potassium in that 60 to 100 pounds per acre. We, we do want to note that sulfur has been mentioned to be a key nutrient as well. Uh, a lot of these recommendations come from the Canadian Hemp Trade Alliance website. Uh, the farmers up in Canada have been growing this crop for 22 years now, and they have done quite a bit of research with this crop. So, so we have to take their lead on some of these unknowns uh, down here in the US. Uh, just to give you an example of what some of the crop looks like uh, with the an adequate amount of nitrogen versus uh, kind of shorting the crop. You can see the, the photo on the left here, about 40 pounds uh, per acre of actual nitrogen. This was applied with uh, composted poultry manure. This was an organic farm on the left-hand side. Uh, the right-hand side there with 125 pounds per acre of nitrogen. Uh, this was a conventional farm that had applied anhydrous ammonia this, the fall before. Uh, the thing you, you can see definitely here is obviously the color difference. Uh, however, the, what you can't see is the height difference. Uh, the crop on the left stands about uh, three and a half feet tall, maybe four feet at the most, uh, while the crop on the right stands about uh, five and a half feet, uh, maybe a little over six feet tall in, in certain spots. So quite the difference there. And, and you can obviously see the, the size of those seed heads as well, uh, the difference in, in what nitrogen can really do. As far as planting is concerned, we really want to have a firm, shallow seed bed. Uh, you know, Steve had, had, had done a lot of soil preparation uh, to get a good seed bed, and I'd say that is pretty critical with this crop. Uh, now, we have had some success with no-till uh, plantings across uh, different areas, but uh, to increase success rates, uh, having a good prepared seed bed is, is ideal. And, and a lot of people think of it as planting alfalfa. If you, if you know how to grow a good alfalfa crop and prepare your seed bed for alfalfa, uh, it's gonna be similar to that uh, with industrial hemp. Uh, our planting depth, depth is relatively shallow. Uh, our target is going to be half an inch. Uh, now we have a quarter to three quarters of an inch. Uh, for those sandy soils, we could go down to a, an inch deep, uh, being that there's less resistance for the crop to get out of the ground. But the reason this is shallow seeding depth is for the fact that it is a weak seedling. It does not have very much vigor as soon as it sprouts out of the seed. So we have to be conscious that if we get this crop too deep, uh, it is going to struggle to come out of the, out of the soil. And, and that, this I will say, planting depth has probably been the most problematic area of this crop for all first time farmers that we've experienced. Uh, a lot of farmers have been unable to uh, adequately plant this crop at the right depth. And for that reason, we've seen a lot of issues with uh, the crop not coming out of the ground. Planting rate, typically between 25 and 35 pounds per acre. Uh, and we're generally, uh, most commonly planting this with either a grain drill or an air drill. Uh, we could use a brilliant seeder or broadcast seeder as long as we're able to keep that depth uh, uh, at least under the soil uh, to, to uh, that half inch or so. Uh, we can use corn planters. Uh, there is a company in Indiana that's currently making uh, hemp plates for John Deere planters. Uh, you could also use the grain sorghum plates. Uh, they would work just fine as well, being that, that seed, seed size is roughly the same size. Uh, and then roughly the planting date for this crop, it'll vary based on where you're located, but uh, usually uh, that month of May into the first half of June. Uh, so we can get this crop to mature with a fairly late planting because it is based on uh, uh, the day length as opposed to growing degree days or heat units. Uh, but uh, targeting, trying to target somewhere above 50 degrees soil temperatures. 
<clears throat> now, one of the things that uh, Steve had mentioned this, and, and we talk about this often because we've had two years in a row now where we've had very, very wet spring seasons. And this is a crop that we want to think differently than other crops, uh, such as corn or soybeans, for example. We want to plant this crop after uh, a rain as opposed to in front of a rain. Now, there are some exceptions to that if you're in arid regions or it's been a dry season, uh, but we have not had uh, a very dry last couple years. So we wanted to, to note this, that most farmers try to plant their crops ahead of the rain uh, to get good moisture in it. Uh, with this crop, if we get any amount of crusting uh, or heavy rainfall immediately after planting, it's going to be disastrous. Uh, so we want to plant this after a rain when the soil is good and moist, uh, not before. So weeds tend to be the most significant pest, and, which is kind of the, the reason why we recommend choosing the correct fields in the first place. This helps to uh, increase your chances of success by choosing fields that have lower weed pressures to begin with. Uh, <clears throat> again, we want to avoid wet weather. Those of you who are organic know that wet weather uh, continues to, to germinate uh, new weed seedlings. Uh, so if we can avoid wet weather, that is ideal. Uh, weed control in the first 30 days is the most critical and, and, and prior to uh, planting. Uh, if we, we can get this crop out of the ground uh, during its slow growth phase, which this picture is a picture of the slow growth phase, uh, if we can get it out of the ground and ahead of the weeds, uh, well ahead of the weeds, uh, we aren't going to likely have much problem. Now the picture here, uh, there's an awful lot of weeds there and there's a lot of unevenness to that crop. Uh, so this was a very wet spring. Uh, in 2018, this photo was taken. Uh, by the end of the season, this crop was over, overrun with uh, the weeds that are there and mostly because they had planted this with a grain drill and were unable to cultivate. So if, if cultivation is desirable, uh, 22 inch rows or 30 inch rows or whatever you're set up for to do some cultivation would be a good idea uh, if, if that is in the, the plan there. But other things to help with uh, reducing weed pressure include, you know, considering planting after a legume sod crop like alfalfa or clover, we get good weed control there. Uh, having good soil fertility, that'll help our hemp crop uh, get well established and enter into that rapid growth stage quicker. And then also uh, planting during a drier period of, of uh, weather, if we actually have some here. Uh, and then maybe the use of some soil amendments like gypsum or lime. Uh, a lot of people talk about the use of uh, soluble calcium helping control some of the weeds to a certain degree. That may be an option as well to look at. Uh, I, I do know that uh, uh, the University of Wisconsin and it, I believe the University of Illinois will be looking at uh, mechanical control uh, methods for, for weed control, such as a rotary hoe or tine weeder. Uh, so some of that stuff is happening right now at the university level, and we will have more recommendations uh, on that as, as time goes on. But uh, for now, I would just be careful. This is a, a really tender seedling. Uh, when it comes out of the ground and, and much uh, mechanical means of weed control may damage and, and really hurt the crop uh, as well. Okay, so diseases, there are two significant uh, diseases with industrial hemp. Uh, we have white mold and gray mold. Uh, both tend to thrive in similar conditions, which are this cool to moderate temperatures. Uh, usually uh, high humidity, these drizzly foggy conditions, uh, similar to what we've had experience with over the last couple years would be good conditions to see these diseases thrive. Uh, you know, there are ways to reduce this disease pressure, such as knowing the history of, of your disease history of your fields uh, to help to avoid planting uh, hemp on those particular fields. Uh, you could, rather than planting after soybeans or some other susceptible crop to white mold, we could plant after corn or wheat or, or any other small grain. And then uh, lastly, we could look at reducing plant populations and widening row spacing so that we can uh, ultimately increase the airflow and dry out the soil underneath the canopy. Now, just one mention here, uh, I will say that one of the diseases that is kind of on the, the watch list uh, right now is the Fusarium flower rot. And uh, this is uh, Fusarium graminearum. 
which is also the same uh, fusarium disease that is affecting uh, wheat, uh, so head scab and, and wheat and barley and oats. Uh, so just keep this in mind that we have started to find this disease now in industrial hemp and, and it is something to just keep in mind in your disease uh, fields that you may have is just keep note of uh, the history of what's happening out there. In regard to insect pests, we really haven't had much of an issue with insects yet. Uh, now, whether the future beholds something different, that, that's uh, untold yet, but so far, uh, we just have not had much problems with insects to date. Uh, Steve had mentioned the Japanese beetles. I will say that that will likely be your most common pest. And here in this photo as well, you can see on the bottom photo, uh, they are almost exclusively attracted to the male plants and, and the male pollen. Very seldom are we finding uh, Japanese beetles on the female plants and uh, eating the leaf material and things like that. So this is a good thing because the male plants, their, their only purpose is to pollinate the females and the females are the only ones that bear seeds. So we can keep the, the beetles on to the male plants. That's perfectly fine because that's half of our, our population out there anyways. Uh, we do have instances where we've seen some corn earworm and European corn borer. Uh, so for those of you who have serious problems with either one of those uh, two uh, insects, then, then this could be a little more elevated risk, but still uh, very low numbers for what we've seen uh, across uh, a wide, wide area uh, that we're dealing with. Okay, so when we get into uh, how do we determine when it's ready to harvest? Uh, so uh, as Steve pointed out earlier that uh, hemp is an indeterminate uh, crop and it will start maturing from the bottom of the seed head to, towards the top. Uh, <clears throat> the seed bracts, and it's a little tough to see here on this uh, uh, slide, but the, the bracts hold the seed in almost like an individual pod, if you will. And as it matures, those pods or bracts start to open and expose the seed to the air and the sun to start drying the grain and, and reducing the moisture. Uh, this is uh, the time that we're going to start harvesting this crop is somewhere between 70 and 80 percent of the seeds being mature. And exactly how Steve had pointed out is the reason for this is that we have this uneven maturity throughout the crop and uh, whether it be because of the birds or because of the shattering uh, or shelling of this crop, we want to harvest before all of the seeds are harvest or, or mature. In addition, uh, it helps to make combining a little bit easier if the crop still has a little bit of moisture in the stalks themselves. Uh, harvest moisture of the grain uh, will be roughly in that 12 to 18 percent moisture. Uh, I will say that 15 is a really good number to try to target. That's where we can start really blowing out some of the chaff and leaf material and get fairly clean grain samples coming into the grain tank of the combine. And then once we have a harvested crop, uh, we're gonna have to dry that crop down to 9% moisture to be a marketable, uh, marketable moisture. So when we get into harvesting, uh, we, we recommend straight cut combining as opposed to swathing. Uh, you can see on the bottom photo here how much biomass or, or plant material is being put into a windrow for, for your uh, uh, picker uh, headers, uh, pickup heads. With this swather is putting a wide row of a lot of stock material and the main objective uh, that we'd like to talk about for combining is that the number one objective needs to be reducing the amount of fiber run through the combine. Uh, otherwise, we're gonna run into some of the issues that Steve was uh, showing there. Of, of when we start getting a lot of stock material and run through that combine, uh, the, those strands of fiber, the bast fibers, are the ones that are gonna start wrapping around shafts and bearings. So if we can limit that, uh, we can reduce drastically how much problems we're gonna have with wrapping. Uh, you know, our, our single rotor combines do tend to work best. Uh, dual rotors tend to have additional issues with wrapping. Uh, so your Lexian and, and New Holland combines tend to have a little more issue. Uh, your, your regular straw walker combines uh, will work just fine as well. Uh, they, they don't have nearly the issue that those uh, dual rotors have. Uh, we do prefer draper headers as opposed to the auger type uh, headers. 
only for the sake that we're able to have an even flow of material through the combine, uh, as opposed to those auger headers where we have to build up so much material to actually flow through the auger. So the way we reduce the amount of uh, fiber intake is by simply taking and cutting the grain heads only. And there are different varieties that do different things. As you saw with uh, Steve's photos there, he had a very long lengthy seed head, which, which was uh, in his case, somewhere between 18 and 24 inches long. That's a fair portion of stock material that you're gonna have to bring into the combine uh, to actually get all the seeds harvested. Whereas you can see in the upper photo here, uh, there are other varieties that have more of a short condensed seed head uh, maybe a little more football shaped, if you will. Here we're, we're only looking at eight to 10, maybe 12 inches worth of uh, a length on a seed head, which helps to reduce the fiber intake in the combine and it further helps to reduce that wrapping problem. So once the grain is harvested, uh, we really wanna handle this crop with care. Uh, and, and the primary reason for that is that the only market for this crop right now is for food grade. Uh, so human consumption. There are no feed markets right now. In fact, it is still technically illegal to be feeding this to livestock. So the only option we have is food grade. And for those of you who have produced a food grade crop before, uh, handling with care is, is key. So preferably, we'd like to see this be handled with conveyors if possible. Uh, we know that most farmers have augers. So uh, just being careful with them, running the augers full, running them slow. Uh, can help reduce the cracking as it's moving along that uh, auger system. Uh, in, in the same with what uh, Steve was doing there, we do recommend uh, using some type of a quick cleaner to just get the chaff and foreign material out of the grain before it goes into the grain bin. Uh, the reason for this is exactly like what, what Steve was mentioning, is that if there is much chaff material, weed seeds, or anything else in that grain, uh, that is a great source of moisture and that moisture is going to start heating the grain and heat it to a point where the oil uh, is, is really no longer usable or it becomes rancid. It reduces the shelf life. So and basically at 120 degrees or higher, uh, we start to oxidize that oil and it, it reduces the shelf life in the grocery store uh, significantly to the point where it's likely going to be rejected upon delivery. Uh, so in that same sense, when we talk about drying, uh, we either need to have grain dryers that have the ability to only throw, say, 80 to 100 degree heat on them, or we resort to forced air aeration bins only. Uh, so those are the two options, low, low heat dryers or aeration bins. And like Steve mentioned, uh, spoilage can begin uh, within that four to six hours after the, the grain has been combined. So timeliness on, on this crop is very important to keep it in good condition uh, if you are looking to sell it. Uh, one of the biggest things, and Steve had already kind of uh, mentioned this, is that do not leave this grain sit in a, gra uh, a grain cart or a grain truck overnight without forced air. Uh, he's exactly right. If you come back in the morning, uh, it will likely be over that 120 degrees and, and you may as well just dump it. Uh, <clears throat> the biggest thing is just to, to monitor that grain regularly. Uh, once we get down below the, usually once we get below that say 12% moisture, the, the risk or the, the fear of the grain heating to a point where it's going to spoil is no longer there. Usually that 11 and 12% is, is the grain is dry enough that it's no longer going to heat. And then we just need to further dry it down to that 9%, which is the marketable moisture. So here's some numbers from uh, some university studies as far as grain yields are concerned. Uh, the bottom study is from the University of Minnesota in 2017. Uh, it was only a one year study that they've done. They have not continued on with that. Uh, due to lack of funding. However, uh, North Dakota State University has continued to do research and variety trials since 2015. Uh, and the latest data that they had published here, uh, which was 2019, uh, I have the three year running average as far as their yield is concerned. So you can see on there, on the North Dakota State University there, that the majority of that crop is yielding somewhere between 
say 1,200, uh, really 1,300 and, and 1,500 pounds per acre. And, and that is quite common, especially on conventional farms. Uh, I will say that organic farms are likely to yield less. Uh, that, that's fairly often that we see that. Uh, it's not necessarily that it has to be that way, but usually the limiting two factors are weed control and nitrogen. So if we can keep good control of the weeds and we have uh, adequate nitrogen, uh, certainly we can be uh, in that, uh, that realm as well. Uh, the, the biggest thing I'll mention here is that uh, you see the names of a lot of these different varieties. Uh, just keep in mind that this market is developing a lot more and is already a, a developed more than the CBD market. And there are particular processors out there buying specific cultivars because they do specific things for their processes. Whether it's getting crushed for oil, dehulled for hemp hearts, or turned into hemp milk, uh, all of these varieties have some unique property to them that individual food processors uh, like and, and want to continue using. So uh, keep, keep that in mind. Uh, then lastly here, uh, once we are finished with harvest, uh, we have the option to go back and bale up this uh, uh, fiber or the stalks that are still left remaining after combining. Uh, so the average yield on the fiber or the stalks after grain harvest is usually in that half to two tons per acre. One ton seems to be about an average. Uh, the biggest thing here is, is the timing of mowing and baling. Uh, you have the option to go out and mow this crop and, and try to bale it before uh, the end of the season. Uh, or preferably, uh, most farmers have, have uh, elected to wait until spring to mow this crop and then bale it in the spring. And a lot of reason being that, as Steve had mentioned, that the crop is very fibrous, uh, very rope-like in the fall. And in the spring, it becomes more brittle, much easier to work with. So uh, as our equipment is concerned, disc mowers, we have to watch that wrapping of the fibers. Uh, whereas uh, our sickle mowers or swathers tend to have a little easier time uh, getting through that material. So just to sum this up, uh, you know, our early season weed control is, is very critical. Uh, make sure you're choosing the right fields. Uh, look to uh, your most productive fields, uh, low weeded pressure, and on the organic systems, it really is best to follow a sod crop if possible to help reduce that weed pressure. Uh, think of other things too. A good, good seedbed preparation and good fertility is also going to help reduce weed pressure and encourage better growth of your, your hemp crop. Um, harvesting the grain heads only to reduce the fiber wrapping is essential. Uh, it may or may not be necessary to clean the grain before drying or going into the bin, but uh, having the option to do so is, is ideal. And then moving that grain to the aeration bins immediately after harvest is, is essential as well. We need that stuff to get get uh, the heat heating element out of the way here. So I just have a, a slide here for some extra resources for those of you that want to learn a little bit more. The Canadian Hemp Trade Alliance, uh, by far the best uh, website out there to, to look at information and, and uh, see what's going on uh, in, in Canada where they've been doing this uh, production for 22 years now. And with that, uh, I don't know if we've got time for questions, but. <laughs> Brian, that was excellent. Uh, thank you so much for covering a lot of territory in a short period of time. Uh, I think it was really good and detailed. Uh, before I turn over to Kim for some questions from the audience, I just wanted to ask, you did briefly mention uh, sort of markets, people, what people are buying. First, I guess, where do people go to find out more information about buyers for uh, hemp grain? And are there particular applications in general that are especially hot right now? Uh, I'm not really sure of a good place to go to find buyers. I think that's kind of been the struggle with hemp so far all along. Yeah, okay. um, I will say that Legacy Hemp is a buyer of this grain. Uh, so we sell seed to farmers and then we buy back that production from farmers. Uh, there are uh, places out there dealing with uh, this grain, but they are kind of scattered. Uh, yeah. You know, There's a facility in Kentucky, North Dakota, um, I don't believe there's anything in Minnesota yet, nothing in Illinois that I'm aware of yet, uh, but they are out there. Uh, they're just few and far between, and it's, it's best to just start talking to the universities, uh, looking at some of the resources that we provided. They likely have a lot of this information of where you could find a buyer. 
the the hot ticket for the markets right now is really crushing the seed for oil. Mm -hmm. uh, now, I don't know exactly where all the oil is being used for. I, I do know that the CBD market is actually one avenue that is a, a fairly large avenue for the oil, mainly for the fact that uh, the CBD tinctures require a carrier oil. And mm -hmm. often uh, it's either going to be MCT coconut oil mm -hmm. or hemp seed oil. So, so that has actually bought, brought more business to the grain industry because of CBD having to blend with other oils. Uh, you know, there are places out there looking at dehulling the hemp seeds for mm -hmm. hemp hearts and also making hemp milk. So, so there are some new and upcoming things that are, are pretty promising. Excellent. Kim, why don't you take it away? Okay, we've got a, a little bit of time left for a couple questions. Um, one viewer wants to know, would you plant hemp back in the same field the following year? Uh, if you're looking to get crop insurance on, on your hemp the second year, no, uh, that is not allowed for crop insurance. Uh, I've never been a big fan of, of double cropping or, or you know, consecutive cropping the same crop anyways, and largely due to the fact that we don't have a lot of pests that are of, of much concern at this point, besides our weed pressure. Uh, the more often that we continue to monocrop, uh, the more likely we're gonna bring in more disease uh, as well as insects to this crop. And, and they're just gonna become familiar to that operation. So I personally would not do it. I, I do know that there's some who have, but uh, uh, if, if it's done, I would keep it to a minimum. And you can't do it in okay. organic rotation either. Great. Uh, kind of following up on that line of thinking, um, if soybean and corn are now possible, and now possibly the small grains have the fusarium, um, and are on the watch list for all of those susceptible diseases, what's the ideal six to eight year crop rotation for planting hemp within that system? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, so I've, I've been a big fan of having, let's just say you have alfalfa in the rotation. If you have, say, oats or barley that you're seeding in the spring, starting your alfalfa with it, you have three years worth of alfalfa production. Uh, some of those alfalfa acres get put into hemp, uh, and then we follow, say, hemp with corn or soybeans, I guess you could do if you're removing the stock material from the hemp. Uh, in that rotation, if we have hemp following alfalfa, uh, yes, we miss out on the nitrogen for our corn. However, we have a lot more tools in our toolbox to use for controlling weeds in our corn. So we can, we know we're going to plant corn on 30 inch rows and, or, you know, whatever it happens to be, we have rotary hose, tying weeders, cultivators, flamers, you name it, we have the tools for corn uh, and we don't have those tools set up for hemp yet. So if we can, if we can be profitable with our hemp following alfalfa and not, and have little weed, con, uh, weed problems, and then the following year we follow that up with corn, uh, it's likely that we still can have a good corn crop following uh, the hemp, as, as uh, Steve had mentioned, we have really good mellow, uh, tilthy soils following hemp, and, and that provides for a good seed bed and, mm -hmm. and uh, likely will, will provide for uh, an opportunity to have good weed control following as well. Excellent. Thank you. And just one last question before we have to move on. Um, can you repeat the name of the company? I believe it was in Indiana that was making the hemp plates for tractors. Uh, I believe the name is Devowis, and I can I can get uh, information to Nathan here after the meeting here. I just came across these guys here within the last two weeks, so um, let me let me make sure I get the correct information to Nathan, and and we'll share that with everybody there. All right, thanks, Brian. Okay, again, Brian, thank you so much. Thank you, Kim. Uh, we're going to move on to Philip Alberti with University of Illinois Extension. Uh, I talked to him. Uh, and had a great conversation with him when we were talking about getting him on this call. And he, he said something to the fact that in the last two, two and a half years, he's gotten essentially a master's degree in hemp just by talking to farmers, going to conferences, and just being out there all the time. And his superiors with Extension have given him the freedom to really dive into this topic. And so I think uh, we're super fortunate to have Philip uh, here in Illinois. And I think he's gonna sort of be our cleanup hitter and tackle any topics or other uh, trends or things that he's seeing and, and kind of wrap this up. Go ahead, Philip. 
All right, thank you very much, Nathan. And yeah, you know, I'm gonna be batting clean up here today. So a lot of the information I'm gonna be talking about will just be kind of clarification, if anything, um, and then also allowing you to answer some questions. So I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen here and we will get started. So not too much to talk about today, but I wanted to say thank you for, for allowing me to be on the program today. Uh, just a few things on the screen here, which you're going to notice, um, you're going to see a QR code in the bottom right hand corner of the screen. And what that is, is a needs based assessment for us at the University of Illinois. What we're trying to do is learn from our stakeholders and people across the region as to what information is valuable to them and what they would like us to focus our time on. Um, it's one thing for me to say, hey, we have 67 people or so on this call and a lot of people are interested in hemp grain, but it's one thing if you tell us that um, and I actually have some data to support that. So please, if you have some time, um, fill out the, the brief needs-based assessment. It will take a few minutes and it's very important for us um, when we're doing research grants um, and asking for funding to have this information to show how valuable it will be. Also, my contact information is at the bottom of the screen. I encourage you to reach out anytime. If you have any questions or looking for resources, um, it's my job to try to find that information for you. So if I don't know the answer off the top of my head, I will do my best to find that for you. So uh, no surprise, industrial hemp was legalized in 2018 and we saw a tremendous amount of interest across the state. Um, I would like to point out though, that of the over 900 growers that we have, you know, a large um, majority of them were for CBD. You'll note based off this map here, we had some interest in grain and fiber and also in the vast majority of that was for CBD production. So we had over 22,000 acres approved for industrial hemp, but it didn't specifically specify whether that was for seed, fiber, or for grain fiber or flour. Until recently, what we just found out as of March 31st, the total number of acres across the state of Illinois for grain fiber and CBD um, in, in, in our own way. It doesn't specifically break that down, but we can, we can get some good information. So we said 22,000 acres were licensed. We had oops, excuse me, uh, over 7,000 planted and only 5,000 of those acres or a little older were actually harvested at the end of the season. I think that just comes with the growing pain of, uh, of a new crop. What I really want to put, uh, put your attention to is our yield information here. And what you'll note is if you look at the yield for seed, 65,489 pounds. If you think about this, and, and as Steve said before, he, he thought he had about 400 pounds of yield and maybe lost about 400 pounds. Um, the literature will say about 1,000 pounds per acre is an expectation or a reasonable expectation for a good grain crop. Now, there's some, uh, some um, liberties we have to take with that. What you'll note, what does that mean? If we have 65,000 pounds divided by 1,000 pounds per acre, you know, we only have 65 acres of production roughly in the state. Now again, that's me taking some liberties here, but my point being is we don't have a lot of acreage for grain in the state of Illinois. And that is simply because we don't have the processing and because this is a new crop. Um, and so if anything, what I really want to illustrate to you is that we have a lot of, of we have a long way to go with learning how to properly grow this crop and ultimately, where are we gonna process it? You know, we, our growers can grow, but we need a place to take it. And so I really just wanted to illustrate to you right now that a vast majority of the interest is in CBD with more leaning towards grain as we, as we move forward, but we're just not there yet. So as mentioned earlier, we did do some trials last year in 2018 across the state with some of my cohorts, Alan Becker uh, and Jesse Sewell. Um, and we just did some very, very basic demonstrations of grain. We worked with growers on CBD plots, but we really wanted to see how does this crop fit into our production are a row crop production state um, by a landslide. So what we did is at one of our locations up in Northern Illinois, as mentioned previously, we did a rolled cereal rye crop with a cooperator. Um, unfortunately, we got planted way late as it was a very wet spring. June 14th, we were past and we really wanted to get this dry crop rolled. And we, uh, we rolled it, crimped it, and we planted directly into that seed bed. So we planted the green. Now, the reason why we did this is simply because we ran out of time and because there was the only way I could get a cooperator to plant the seed for me, I was to do it their way and to fit into their production system. Uh, but I was all for it. I think using cover crops was a very interesting way to, to give hemp a try. 
And so what were the results? Well, they were quite varied. Um, in short, you know, we have a lot of work to do in figuring out how this will work, but I, I did think this was kind of interesting. Um, we saw some, uh, the path, picture on the right is a, uh, is a, is a no-till field with no residue, no cover crop, and on the left was the field that was planted directly into. Uh, what I want to illustrate to you here is that we have a long way to go. But we saw some encouraging signs for weed control of everything outside of hemp. It's just that we had a large variation in the germination and emergence of hemp across the field. And because of that, we need to figure out a little bit more about how we can do some residue control, perhaps some more down pressure, increasing seeding rates, things like that. But to be honest, after one year without really knowing what to expect and having no literature to support the use of a cover crop, I was intrigued by the results and we're going to give it a go again this year, uh, courtesy of our co collaboration with Brian Parr and Legacy Hemp. So moving forward, you know, I want to talk about a few things from an extension standpoint, things that I come across a lot that you might find uh, valuable to know. As Steve mentioned before, you know, if you are growing hemp, whether it's for grain or fiber or CBD, you have to follow state compliance. Okay, you need to do that, um, even if it may not seem necessary like you have to. For the grain side, you do, you absolutely do. So what do you need? The documentation, as always, your grower and processor license. Make sure that you and the people that you're dealing with in this industry have it. Um, and if you're trying to purchase seed, they really should ask for it ahead of time, making sure uh, that you feel comfortable. Um, that's a good sign that, they, that they're, they know what's going on. And also a certificate of analysis. Again, if they're grain, fiber, or CBD production, you need to have these certificates of analysis upon production. Um, uh, purchasing, and it's just something, again, it's a new standard for the industry that we have to uh, be aware of. A few terms I want to throw around here that I think you might find um, uh, interesting. There's been a lot of discussion, uh, particularly in, in the academic circles, regarding terminology in this new system. How do we phrase the type of production that we are doing? So two terms, feminized and dioecious. Um, typically, hemp is a dioecious crop. Plants. This is encouraged um, in a grain or fiber production system. However, it is not in a CBD production system, uh, typically, as we know it. So feminized, meaning that there are um, female plants only. That is typically what we're going to see in a CBD production system. Meanwhile, a dioecious production on the right is more like a, a grain uh, fiber operation, similar to our row crop production and how we plant it. And there are both males and females in the field. Okay, so that distinction between feminized versus dioecious production is probably going to give you an indication of what type of crop you are growing. Um, it seems like a very simple distinction, but I had growers calling me saying they were going to plant 100 acres of, of CBD hemp with a grain drill using dioecious seeds. So there's confusion out there. Just want to make sure we're clear. And then the discussion of auto flower versus full season. Auto flower is typically something we're going to be seeing more in a grain fiber variety where they're going to be maturing um, more like corn than they would be uh, something like our CBD variety with the photo period dependent and are flowering based on day length. So just a few terms I wanted you to be aware of, ones you might see. Um, but note that there are going to be a lot of changes, I think, in industrial hemp moving forward and the types of production. There's a lot of talk out there regarding what we call the the three, four, the grain, fiber, and CBD production system, which can take advantage of these dioecious production systems and get three main products at the end of the season. However, again, we have a long way to go. So seed purity, uh, just a few things I want to point out there. You know, this is going to be, uh, we don't have that inherent trust in a lot of cases with, with uh, our, our seed distributors because this, this is a new industry. So making sure you're familiar with how to properly read a bag of hemp seed regarding uh, foreign material germination uh, rates and how you can account for that in your season. Um, again, this is just a new crop and it's something that we want to brush up on uh, in this new industry. And then also certificates of analysis, they can be falsified. They can be doctored quite easily. And we're seeing more and more about this um, happening. Please make sure to verify and call the lab. On the uh, certificate of analysis, there should be a batch or a uh, a sample ID number, they will call, you can call it, they will verify whether or not that is indeed um, a true certificate of analysis. And right now, as we're looking for clarity, it certainly would occur. Um, here are the four state labs that will do a certificate of analysis in the state of Illinois uh, for the Illinois Department of Agriculture. You can 
can find all of this information on their website as well as ours at go.illinois.edu. Or just Google University of Illinois Hemp. It'll take you to our webpage and with the ultimate One last thing I think I really want to touch on here regarding the rules and regulations is just that for one more year at least, uh, this until October 31st, 2020, Illinois will be what we call a Delta 9 state. So we will be looking at Delta 9 THC, 0.3% Delta 9 THC as our threshold, whereas the USDA will be looking at 0.3% total. Frank, Frank, you're breaking up just a little bit. Can you speak more closely to the mic? Uh, sure, yeah. Uh, so. Um, Illinois, at least until October 31st, 2020, this coming October, we will be a Delta 9 state, meaning that we will be uh, compliant crops in the state of Illinois will have to test below 0.3% Delta 9 THC. However, the United States, the USDA and their rules and regulations uh, look at total THC, so 0.3% total THC. It's a subtle distinction, but a very important one. And what that means for interstate commerce. Okay, so my point being, you are allowed to take hemp material provided it passes compliance into any state in the country, again, provided it passes compliance. However, the Illinois thresholds are essentially a little less stringent than the federal guidelines are, and so in some cases what will happen is you will be compliant in the state of Illinois, but if you go over uh, the state lines into another state, you will be not of that total versus delta uh, 9 THC. So again, making sure you the state requirements, um, where you are and where you're going to be transporting your material. So what happens in 2020 when, when the Illinois adapt, adopts these USDA rules? Will your crop immediately become non-compliant if it's above the delta 9 threshold? No. The idea will be that we will have a fit for commerce uh, or um, a stamp on that product, but you will have to keep it um, within the state of Illinois. And keep it in the oh. There be more information coming out on that uh, as you move forward, but the intention is that you're not going to have a crop that is one day compliant be all of a sudden non compliant the following day. And that is from the Department of Agriculture. The last thing I'd like to really point you to is our resources. We are building this webpage out every day. Um, I keep finding ways or resources to add. It and I we keep trying to update it. So go.illinois.edu slash the best way to get resources for the state of Illinois and also find out who to contact um, and where to get a hold of them. We have production resources, we have seed sources for grain fiber and CBD, uh, as well as links to potential catalogs and so people to contact. We have a buyer seller network that might be a place to look if you're looking to sell some of your material or buy um, some of your grain, fiber, CBD, things of that nature. Um, and then also, we do have many research plans for 2020. While not doing specific variety trials, we will be doing some work in the CBD space, but also looking at grain and fiber varieties across the state to see how they're performing. Uh, and that will be the first set of truly replicated trials we will be doing in the state of Illinois. Uh, and we're really looking forward to it. We have a large team that's expanding consistently, and uh, we're excited to see the projects that we come up with. And lastly, that needs-based assessment, I can't tell you how important it is. Uh, Brian talked about lack of funding and other research programs. Getting your input and where we can improve, what studies we can focus our time on is really beneficial in writing these grants. So please, I cannot tell you how much it would mean to us if you could fill those out. It will take a few minutes. Uh, but again, my information is at the bottom of the screen. It's my job to try to connect people. If you have any questions, do not hesitate to reach out to us. And with that, I'll say thank you and Mr. Thompson. Uh, Phil, thank you so much. That was excellent. We're very, very fortunate to have you here um, in Illinois doing what you're doing. I know you take special attention to speaking really in a nuanced way about factual information so people can make good choices. Um, I have a real quick question. Um, just in general, I guess our What's the, what's the trend do you see in Illinois in terms of what uh, hemp grain farmers are doing? Are the numbers growing? I think there's a, a general interest uh, growing, absolutely. But just to get them to actually put the investment in to plant the crop um, is, is something else entirely. You know, we, we talk about this all the time, the chicken for the egg, right? Do we need a processor who wants to establish a belief? 
you get growers who want to grow it and then you know get processing to come this way but it's just so new that um we have a lot of we have a lot of work and it's going to take some patience but even on the application side you know there's there's going to be some boundaries we have to overcome there's a lot of interest in the states at grain hemp as potential animal or use as a uh, but we're not there yet we can't do that in the states we cannot feed grain hemp to our animals for human consumption um, although other countries uh, are doing that currently so you know we just we have to be patient and, and keep doing the due diligence trying to get figure out what's going to work for our growers and it's going to take time i'll tell you though that of all the cbd growers that i work with who do grow row crops they want to grow grain and fiber they would they would fit their production system it's much more what they're akin to and we are grain we are row crop producers in the state of illinois and we know how to do it well i think there's just tremendous interest but uh better to, to, to keep the cart you know behind the horse you know. exactly Kim, I'm going to turn over to you real quickly. Okay. Uh, speaking of information, I'm just going to run this uh, poll. If people have a chance to do this while you're listening to questions, that would be awesome. Um, Kim, why don't you go ahead? Sure. Um, we have one question that says, uh, is there a reason that testing is required 15 to 30 days before harvest? It seems that the cannabinoid, cannabinoids could change drastically within that time frame. Does the pre-test qualify analysis for the harvested product i believe i understand the question there um but i'm just going to kind of go through some points here and jeff if i'm not answering it please just type in the chat box and we'll get that answer um is there a reason the testing is required yes uh, in short the, the government the illinois department of agriculture the usda they, they want to make sure you're, you're not growing something that is latently marijuana um you know these tests are in place these are uh, quality control to make sure that you are not growing something that is most obviously not hemp, you know, or closer to marijuana. And that's really why they're testing it. Um, these plants look the same. They certainly smell the same. And so we want to make sure uh, these regulations are in place for the better of the betterment of the grower and also, also for the product. That you have. So that's why they, they, they're requiring the testing for that you're not taking a illegal product that is technically marijuana off the field. You know what I'm saying? So it's either, that's why they want to keep it there. Um, as far as if you have to get another test after the product is harvested, the processors are probably going to want to do that either themselves or, or potentially ask you to do that. So the testing to the Department of Agriculture is a compliance testing and that is not for the final product. That is specifically so you can get that crop off the field. Um, but in many cases, processors are going to want to do a second round of testing to make sure it's fitting with either, you know, their processing equipment um, and, and that end use. I hope that is good. Okay. Um, another question we have is, are you hearing that animal bedding is opening up for hemp, for, you know, for use in hemp products? Uh, I not so much on a large scale. I've had several growers call me and say that they they want to use the hemp for animal bedding, or is there a place that they can find some more hemp to use as animal bedding? So I think there's certainly an interest there. Um, you know, I, I really can't speak to you know its efficacy there, but definitely uh, interest on my end, and I think that'd be something that's worth exploring. But uh, just don't have enough. Okay. Yeah, there's a lot of animal bedding used from the from the the not the best fibers. Yeah, the best fibers from hemp. It's just getting it processed and getting it uh, readily available. But it's used a lot in horse bedding. Okay. Um, now would be a good time to open it up for anyone that has questions to any of our our speakers. I just can I just jump in, um, Bill? When we had talked before, you had mentioned that you thought the future of hemp. Uh, production might be sort of multiple uses in one one seasons of one season's crop. Can you say a little more about that? Sure. So uh, it goes back a little bit to the dioecious production that I was talking about versus feminized. So dioecious production produces both male and female plants. Um, so the the plants grow tall for that fiber. They pollinate, and we get seed, so we get grain and fiber. But then also, as Steve showed in his certificate of analysis earlier. It was still that grain was still producing two percent CBD. 
So that material, that floral material, those oils can be extracted. You can harvest the grain and you can also get that fighting stuff at the end of the season. And there's even equipment out there that can do all of this in one fell swoop. Um, and as we get more mechanized, uh, that, that might be more of a possibility. And you know, for all I know, it could be a reach uh, on my part. I just see that we grow these crops so well. Um, and, and at least in, you know, speak to Illinois, we grow, hey, we grow Illinois, we grow, I'm sorry, uh, corn, we grow soybeans, and we do it well, and the equipment that we have fits that type of production. Um, it's just gonna be fine tuning it and seeing if it's gonna be, um, you know, that, that cost benefit. But I just see it as a tremendous opportunity to explore and to be able to get three uses out of a single crop um, would be very interesting. Again, I can't speak, but I think that might be something I definitely like to look into moving forward. Okay. Um, there's a question here. It says, is there interest in action in Illinois for making biochar from the biomass residue? And who can provide the biomass? Hey, Paul, uh, appreciate you reaching out in there. Um, yes, there absolutely is a lot of interest in uh, biochar from the residue, uh, but who can provide the biomass? I guess it depends specifically on the type of biomass you are you are looking for and the quality of that biomass. But yeah, you know that's another application. I think I think these chats are just showing the tremendous amount of potential that and, and uh, applications that we hear about with them. Um, but it's just still so new. So yes, Paul, there's definitely some interest in Illinois, um, and you're not the first person I've heard bring up biochar. Um, I don't know, Steve or Ben, would you have any other comments on that? Biochar, in dealing with the, what's left of that material, uh, getting it compacted in, in a burnable state and keeping the pyrolysis where it belongs, I envision it being pretty damn hard to, to deal with. Okay. Thank you. And Rachel Barry. One last question here. Go ahead. No, sorry, I just wanted to plug uh, Rachel Berry and the Illinois Hemp Growers Association is on the call. Uh, they provide a lot of great services for growers in the state of Illinois. And so if you need help going through applications or variety, looking at, to make connections with growers or processors, they do a good person to reach out to. That's Rachel Berry, uh, Illinois Hemp Growers Association. Excellent. Thank you for making that point. And um, there was a question here as asking what is the departmental fee for growers in Illinois for their mandated testing? And Jeff answered he paid $75 per test from the lab in Sparta. For those of you that can't see the chat, has anyone else paid a different fee? Okay. Nathan, how are we doing on time? I, I think we're going to wrap it up here. Um, again, I, I want to offer a special thanks to everyone who participated. We had a good crowd. Uh, glad that there's so much interest. want to offer a special thanks to Steve, to Brian, and Phil for taking time and really preparing for this and being interested in this. Kim, thank you so much for helping to moderate that. It was really excellent. We will be sending out uh, a link uh, to this recording later on. We will be sending out resources. The emails again for Steve, Brian, and Phil. Um, we'll be sharing emails. We hope that's okay. And uh, I also want to sort of just say, I remember talking to Steve, and Steve had a nice line. He said, "Growing hemp ain't easy, but it's worth it." And I hope that that's going to be the case going forward. Thank you again for joining us. I wish you each good luck, good weather, and smart farming. Take care of yourselves. Thanks again. <laughs>